Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood, a Percy Jackson read along podcast. I'm B. And I'm Zach. And this week we read chapter 17 of Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters. We get a surprise on Miami Beach. Yes, and we certainly do push it to the limit. <laughs> do, 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 do. As I kept thinking about, was everything like Miami, like 80s, like vaporwave, like Miami, is what I was like, oh man. I guess. I feel like I either think of like a sort of party scene in Miami or I think of the Golden Girls, as I think I mentioned in our last episode. Just like, you know. Well, for me, what I think about B is I just think of like Miami Vice and it's just like a bunch of like powder white suits and like people with like gigantic bushy mustaches. Yeah, it's like blazers that are somehow cuffed. That kind of aesthetic was really popular. Um, I feel like my internal understanding of Miami Vice is just Grand Theft Auto Vice City, so it's not even <laughs> really actually Miami Vice. It's just sort of a, a copy of a copy of a memory. No, there's certainly like a lot of things that are similar to that, but my favorite thing about that, though, is like the weird aesthetic from like watching a lot of movies that are set. I'm doing quotation marks. In Miami, of like old dudes with like they have blazers on but no shirts, and it's just really disturbing. Uh, yeah, that's I'm really glad that that's not really a look anymore. Is the no shirt blazer situation just really glad we moved past that? So, yeah, so this week we read a surprise in Miami, which you know, certainly I'm thank God that Luke doesn't do that in this chapter. Oh, yeah, that would be like uh, such a weird detail if he was just like fully embracing the Miami culture, but for some reason in the 80s and not in the 2000s, as this is that's when it takes place, right? Like it takes place during the time that it's written, Percy Jackson. I'm so. going to assume it takes place in the time that it's written because there are like things, yeah, like, there's remember? some references, Hillary right? Duff yeah, was right, boss. he references Hillary Duff, yeah, because like Hillary Duff was popular. And later on, they have, like, a Nintendo Wii. Do you remember when the Nintendo Wii was new? Do you remember that? Because I feel like it just happened that the Nintendo Wii was released. And then I just recently got a notification on my Wii while I was, like, watching Netflix that Nintendo is taking Netflix off of the Wii, like, as of, like, January 30th or something because it's so old and they don't want to keep... I guess, paying to have Netflix. I don't know how it works exactly, but I'm, I'm not going to have Netflix on there anymore. I would imagine that paying the licensing fees is most likely what it is, is every year they have to pay to have Netflix on their device. How am I going to watch Netflix on my TV now? I don't know. I mean, I have a Roku in my apartment, but here at my parents' house, not so much. So we're going to have to like get a Roku or like some other fancy TV situation. I prefer, so for me, this is not endorsement. I prefer my Google Home, which is pretty much like a fire stick. You put into your good old TV and then everything's good. And you can watch Netflix, Hulu, all those wonderful things. And I love it. Yeah. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a thousand years old because I feel like the Wii just came out and it was actually like a decade ago. Um, how did that happen? But yeah, so what did you think of this chapter, B? I thought it was good. A lot happens. Not anything that I guessed, um, which is a change of pace, humble brag, um, because I thought, well, I guess everything kind of starts to get wrapped up in some ways. I thought that a lot less would happen in this chapter. For me, when it came to like the situation I was reading in, it's like, wow, a lot of things are getting wrapped up in this chapter. Like I knew that like certain things with Tantalus was going to happen. But I forgot it was going to happen in this situation. I thought it was going to be like, oh, yeah, they get to the camp and they prove everything that Tantalus is wrong. And Creon is the person that's going to do this all. And this is amazing. And it doesn't happen like that. I forgot. It's very much like the we'll, we'll get into it. But I felt like that was like the ultimate trope of tropes of how they solve their problem. It just all seems to fall into place, especially because last chapter when they leave off showing up like at or actually when we read the chapter title and I, I knew that they were gonna be on Miami, Miami Beach and I knew that they had to get from Florida all the way to New York to return to camp and save Talia's tree with the fleece like that's the whole thing and in some ways that's almost the plot of a whole book if you were to draw it out that way like oh we have to go on this trip 
if you think about it, like you could really draw out the whole plot of them getting to from Florida to New York. Like that's kind of a long ways to go. And they even mentioned that like um, Clarice starts to freak out. Like, well, how are we supposed to get there by tonight? We've been gone for so long. And then Grover is saying like, oh, we really should rush to save Talia's tree. And Clarice is pretty like beaten down by the whole idea of getting there in time because they have like no ride. They don't have any money. And then all of a sudden everything falls into place of like she tells them her oracle all of a sudden out of nowhere deus ex tyson pulls out his bag full of money and is like oh he has a lot of cash he's just like oh yeah i thought this was supposed to be like chicken feed or something i was gonna feed it to yeah, rainbow he thought it was feed for for rainbow and it's so funny that he always seems to be like the secret um uh, weapon if you think about it be actually it is tyson but really it's hermes thinking ahead like, all the things that have helped him throughout this journey has been because of Hermes. That's true. Hermes did pack well for them, but they thought that they lost all that money until Tyson grabbed it. Not because he was thinking ahead, but it's sort of like that trope of, um, like, the the helpful idiot, which I feel like is almost like an offensive way to phrase it, but it's like he he's helpful in ways that he doesn't even realize. He just sort of, like, wanders into helpfulness, just like how he wanders into trouble. Like, he doesn't really do anything very intentionally other than, like, I guess be kind to animals. Like, he doesn't have a lot of plans as far as thinking ahead. So it's just really funny that he happens to be like, oh, well, I didn't even realize this was a bag of money, the green paper that will help you. And then, you know... Uh, Clarice tells them the whole idea of, like, what her quest was supposed to be, and then, for once, Percy actually understands a, an oracle, like, immediately, and is like, oh, well, obviously, you should do this, you should do this. Well, because it's, like, so stupid easy, because it's, like, the idea of interpretation, which Percy, I give credit for, he's very great at thinking at his feet. I think some of his best decisions are actually when he doesn't think. But sometimes when he actually puts his brain power, like some great results happen, such as with here. I think, again, it's kind of like one of those things with Tyson where he's convenient for convenience sake. Like, oh, I saved all this this money. I thought it was supposed to be like for Rainbow, like to eat and stuff. And th they didn't like it. Yeah, he wouldn't save money because it's money. He wouldn't. I mean, I could just as easily see Tyson throwing out a bag of money because it wasn't feed for Rainbow. So it didn't matter. Like he's he's not ever helpful in like an intentional way other than I guess being sort of like the muscle that like sometimes I mean, even in this chapter, like when spoiler alert, Luke shows up. Well, like I said before, he's kind of like sloth from the Goonies a little bit. And he's just he's really helpful. There's some situations where he becomes super helpful. Yeah, just out of nowhere, he seems to have everything that they need, which I guess is kind of good. I'm glad that a lot of stuff gets or starts to get wrapped up in this chapter because it would just be like way too much if you had to really plod through the rest of this. Like, oh, what's going to happen with Kronos and Luke and Chiron? I mean, I recited the laundry list of stuff that we need to wrap up in the last chapter and like I had to sort of conceptualize like how are they going to do this how are they going to wrap it all up so quickly and that's exactly what Rick Curtin did is he literally just was like well this gets done and this gets done and this yeah but if you like really think about it B it's kind of like this is a very condensed version of the ending of the lightning thief it's the exact same beats to the point of where well we have to take an airplane to get there we'll do this we we'll, we have enough money for one plane ticket, and we'll do all these things. And I think that's really clever to have. Again, it's something that's familiar, but at the same time, you clear up this plot element of, oh, we have to get the Golden Fleece, and then we go, oh, thank God, we'll figure out another way to get out of Florida towards Camp Half-Blood, and then all of a sudden you meet Luke again. You kind of have the, oh, not having the trope of, oh, he has the fleece. Now we have to have, like, three chapters of him getting it back, and then we go back to Camp Half-Blood. Because, again, much like the Lightning Thief, they're on the very last day of their quest. They don't have any money. They figure out a way to get money, get a plane ticket, and send the item, the magical item, again, over the airwaves, thanks to Zeus and the airplanes. So thank you for flying United. It ends up being really helpful that they semi-befriended Clarice in the sense that she can actually fly in a plane without Zeus getting angry about it. I think that it's sort of ridiculous that it's still a thing, but... Well, I don't know. It seems like such a weird thing, because again, she's the daughter of Ares. Ares tried to help dethrone Zeus last year. 
You would think that that would be like a catch-22. I don't know why she's exempt from his rage for some reason, but um, yeah, I don't know why that that grudge doesn't apply to her necessarily, but I guess it, it doesn't, because there's a specific thing between Poseidon and Zeus. Like The only one that would like seem like they wouldn't be affected by this would be if they gave Grover the Golden Fleece, and it's like, right? go fly. I feel like that would make more sense. They give it to Athena, because more of their like neutral parties... But then again, the most important thing about this chapter I find to be the most important is Percy Jackson realizes that if he completes this good old quest, he would be the biggest jerk because it's technically Clarice's adventure and trip. And I like that about that is that, you know, Percy Jackson steps back as the titular character, much as like in Harry Potter. Just imagine like being a student at Hogwarts during Harry Potter's term. Oh, you'd roll your eyes every time you walked down the hall. Harry Potter like saved the Philosopher's Stone. Harry Potter saved and went into the Chamber of Secrets. You know, oh, he found the Prisoner of Azkaban. Like all these things. Oh, Percy Jackson, you know, is like steps back and he's just not the titular character of this book. He's just like, you know what, Clarice? You're the person that is in this adventure. You should do this. This is your thing. Because again, he kind of remembers about going back into like the boiler room in the Birmingham and hearing all the fight they had between Clarice and Ares. And it's one of those humble things of just having a character that's kind of like steps back from his power a little bit. And it's like, you know what? I could be the hero for this adventure, but I want to give it to Clarice because this is her one chance to do this. Because in the context of Percy Jackson, Luke already had his quest. Annabeth technically went on a quest last year. Clarice, this is what they train for, is to go on quests. And I think having the idea of not stealing the limelight is a very important thing for a kid. Well, especially because Clarice is Ares' daughter, and that, like, Percy even makes that point, like, oh, right, when she had that interaction with her dad. Like, he doesn't care about Camp Half-Blood, he just cares about her succeeding. Like, obviously, he's a very overbearing parent in some ways obviously not in like a caring way but yeah he's like exactly he's like a sports dad he's like oh well you gotta win 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 and that would be like a really big failure for her if she didn't succeed in this quest that was hers and then percy kind of swooped in and took it from her because his friends were involved but the whole point as clarice elucidates when she tells them what her prophecy is is that all of her friends have to help. Like, I mean, it's it's mentioned right there, like a fail without friends to fly home alone and fail without fl- friends to fly home alone. So it's like sort of, do you want to read that whole thing? We can like totally like talk about the prophecy right now. Yeah, let's let's totally do it. I'll I'll take one line, you take the other. Okay, we kind of, we could break this down. I mean, they did break it down in the chapter, but let's, let's do it in a more interesting yeah. way. You shall sail the iron ship with warriors of bone. You shall find what you seek and make it your own. But despair for your life entombed within stone. And fail without friends to fly home alone. Which, you know, the first part's obvious. It's the ironclad warship, the CSS Birmingham. Yeah, we so we did that, yeah. Doing a checklist again with the with the prophecy. Find what you seek and make it your own. So they got the fleece. But Clarice didn't technically make it her own. She just... Actually, yeah, no, she did, because remember, she flung Annabeth over her shoulder with the fleece on her shoulder. Yeah. What does despair for your life entombed within stone? Oh, that's going to be, remember, Polyphemus tried to marry her, and he put her in the cave. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's kind of phrased in a weird way that it doesn't jump out to me. Because remember, if you're going to get married, that's like a despair of your life. If you don't want to, it's like a shotgun wedding. Got it. Okay. That's what that is. And then and fail without friends. And fail friends. without friends to fly home alone. So she meets Macaulay Culkin and goes to New York. Yeah. The caveat being without friends. So you will fail to fly home alone without friends. So it's like this weird, the way that prophecies are phrased, right? Prophecies are almost phrased like Rick Riordan writes his chapters. <laughs> like they're not always literal. They're kind of wordplay is happening there. Well, I mean, I think also the prophecies that Rick Riordan writes are kind of like morality tales about oneself. Because if we look at the lightning thief, the whole point of that prophecy is Percy Jackson needs to let go of his mom. And in the end, you know, he fails to save what matters most in the end. And here it's, Clarice goes on the quest without any friends because she doesn't have any. And without friends, she would fail her quest, which would have happened if she wasn't on that plane. They didn't take her to the Miami airport and she flew away. Luke would have gotten her. Right. And if they didn't give her the money, 
that she had no money when she washed up on the shores of Miami. Like, there's a lot of reasons why she needs each of them. You know, she wouldn't be able to get the fleece in the first place if they weren't all there to work together. Yeah, and it's kind of like the idea with the prophecies is, you know, now she can trust people, hopefully. That's kind of like her lesson is she can have friends. It's okay to have friends and not be competitive. And maybe that's kind of like what the idea of the prophecies are, is just showing people the worst of themselves. Same as with the sirens and how Annabeth became smarter because she realized what her fatal flaw is. I mean, hubris is definitely also Clarice's fatal flaw, or at least one of her flaws. I don't think it actually is hubris. I think a lot of it is, yes, she's very prideful, but also she's very, like, pig-headed. She doesn't, like, listen to people. Well, she's yeah, very, like, that's, like, that's hubris to some extent. Like, she thinks she can do things all on her own, and that's why... It's so important that this is her prophecy and this is what she needs to do. She needs to work with other people. Actually, you know what? I think her fatal flaw probably is not trusting people. Because, again, the beginning of this quest, she doesn't trust Percy. She doesn't trust any of her friends to go on this quest. Because of that, when she lands... Actually, she wouldn't have even been able to like go into the Sea of Monsters with Cilia and Charybdis. Even if she made it through that, she would have died from Polyphemus. She would have been eaten or married by him. I mean, but that's like a type of hubris, right? Because hubris is all about assuming that you can do it better than other people. That's the point that they make with Annabeth, that she's like, oh, well, the world would be better if only people like me could redesign it all. If only I could, you know, make New York this like towering wonderland with all of my designs and everything would be perfect because I can do it better. And then, you know, contrast with Percy, who's like, I think that that's terrible. If the world was run by me, it would be a disaster. But that's definitely Clarice's, um, like, MO, where she thinks that she can do everything the best herself. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, a lot of things that are her fatal flaws. I mean, yes, hubris is probably one of them, but I feel like some of it has to be, like, she wants to impress everybody as well. That's, like, she wants to impress her dad. She wants to impress a lot of people, except it is a mixture of hubris, but I also think it's just she's very competitive as well, and she doesn't, like, like to listen to people but the little voice in her head that says, go, go, rah, rah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sometimes it's like not even necessarily about her wanting to do something. And it's more about impressing her dad. So like it, she has to do it on her own because in some ways she's like, oh, I'll be a failure if I don't do this completely by myself because then it doesn't count or something, which has a lot to do with the way Aries treats her. Yeah, because if you like look at like Annabeth, who hers is obviously hubris, where she wants to build pretty much olympus on earth but also if we look at polyphemus what happens with her is she's the one that takes charge puts on the invisibility cap and she's the one that gets captured because she has to command everything in that situation because she is who she is but when we look at clarice even on the attack on half blood hill she like tends to the wounded like she freaks out when like people in her command are getting hurt as well as in the cave Annabeth is the exact opposite. She wants to take charge of everything, whereas Clary's is the leader, but she realizes when it's okay to, like, retreat and kind of have, like, a strategic surrender, almost. Yeah, well, I guess because also that's, like, the warlike aspect of Clarice because she's way more into strategy, and that has a lot to do with working with other people, but maybe she's not the best at it yet because she, like, has this internalized thing from Ares being like, oh, well, you have to succeed all on your own. Um, And that's why it's very important that she works with all of them. Yeah, that's kind of like one of those things where it's, it's really interesting. Again, I think maybe it's a lot like the overbearing parents and kind of like sports parents or like helicopter parents a little bit. Yeah, but he's not Whereas even really a helicopter Ares parent. Ares is totally like, no, he's totally like a her- helicopter parent. Well, because helicopter look at- parents, I feel like, are more like doting like emotionally like he's he, yeah he's more like a like a stage parent or like a sports parent where it's not about actually the kid at all it's about their accomplishments and like living vicariously through them and that kind of messed up yeah thing. so i can just imagine like aries has like the i want to speak to your manager haircut <laughs> yeah that's like a weird alternate timeline where like aries is a dance mom <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'd like to speak to your manager. This coupon was expired three weeks ago, but, like, I want you to, like, validate it. Yeah, just taking Clarice to, like, get spray tanned and put in, like, her weird fake teeth. 
<laughs> oh God. Oh man, this this is terrible. This is this is an alternate reality that I don't want to read. It's a very dark timeline, and this is a pretty dark timeline. The one that's in the book, so um, that's saying something. But all in all, I don't consider like Clarice to be a bad character. Like she does have her flaws, but. Even in, like, her tough, like, exoskeleton exterior <laughs> exoskeleton. of a cold, dead heart, She's a she spider. actually cares about people. <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. I actually really like Clarice as a character because I think she's maybe shown the most growth as far as the main characters that we focused on. Um, maybe Annabeth has to some extent because she's grown just in this book from having her own hang-ups about Cyclopses to learning to accept Tyson and that kind of thing, but... I, as far as like such a, a night and day change, like she's very aggressive in the first book. She has everything against Percy. She has this internalized, well, yeah, she has also like the internalized Aries thing of being like, oh, you're my enemy because you're from another cabin and X, Y, Z. Like we have all of these, these hangups from a million years ago that like don't really apply to my life, but I'm going to believe them. Which is something that actually happens a lot in these books. Especially, like, we look at the first book, Annabeth and Percy, their parents are, like, mortal enemies, almost, and, like, they hate each other, and now we have Percy, who Ares hates him, and now Clarice is hanging out with him, and they have to figure out, like, hey, you're not so different, you and I, type of, I hate using that, but that's pretty much what it is, is they actually have to spend time with each other, so, again, in the end, they become friends, whereas their parents are mortal enemies. Yeah, well, it, it's definitely a lesson in learning who people are instead of what they are. Well, it's kind of like the idea of, like, hey, because I told you you hate him, you hate him. Yeah, or even just, like, the, the lesson that Annabeth learns for not hating Tyson because of all of these preconceived notions about Cyclopses, like... Percy learns that just because you're a part of a certain cabin doesn't mean you're, you know, not a good person. And Annabeth learns just because you're a Cyclops doesn't mean that you're bad. Like, there are all these different lessons that are kind of all mirroring each other about, like, actually getting to know someone as an individual instead of making all these assumptions or having all these, like, pre-existing grudges. Do you know what would benefit from this, be? Who? <laughs> Hogwarts houses. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, in Harry Potter, is a terrible lesson. Like, everyone has to hate each other. If you're a Slytherin house, you're, like, evil snake house. If you're Hufflepuff, you're, like, dumb honey badger house. And if you're Ravenclaw, you're just eagle smart, apparently. You're eagle smart. they don't have a raven as their... Yeah. That's so confusing. Anyway, don't get me started on how... Like, I mean, like, we. I actually just had a conversation with Sarah about this. How a lot of YA is really obsessed with the categorization of people, and that seems to be like a really good marketing technique in some ways because kids love to like sort themselves into things like, oh, I'm Aries Cabin, and I'm a Slytherin, and I like, and then even like. You go to the example of the Hunger Games. Even in, like, Hunger Games, like, I've noticed that because you have the different districts. Like, oh, I'm District 13 because I feel like all these ways. Like, agricultural <laughs> area. Like, that's just the places that people live that doesn't necessarily speak to the personality type that you have. I believe the reason for that is because as a teenager or even before that, even as a preteen, you kind of want to find the clique that you're in. Yeah. Because in high school and in middle school, you try to find the groups. Like, for me... Like I was, I loved movies, so I ended up going towards the like the movie people click and horror movie click. Whereas when I was younger, I was tried to tried to be in the anime click. Oh well, yeah, you you showed me how that turned out. <laughs> yeah, it it turned out well. It turned out so well. I mean, that's just like human nature to some extent. Like, oh, these are my people. We categorize ourselves based on the things that we like or based on some sort of common attribute. But I really like how. Specifically in Percy Jackson, I think Rick Riordan's trying to show the opposite of what a lot of those other types of categorizations tend to, like, reinforce, like, the idea that, like, oh, well, the there's different types of people, and they're so different in every way, and they're innately not going to find common ground, while a lot of, especially this book, has been, you know, teaching the lesson of 
well, yeah, you can have some innate differences like, oh, well, you're you're the son of Poseidon, so you have water powers or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily speak to your ability to get along with people. If you're a sibling of Ares, you have rage powers. Yeah, well, that's like another thing too, right? Because that's like such a stereotype that Clarice, to some extent, embodies, especially in the first book, where she immediately attacks Percy and there's like the whole thing of like, I become supreme lord of the toilet or whatever, where she gives him like a swirly and all of that. And then Percy gets the best of her and then you have like... Athena Cabin, which is just a bunch of smarties, but in situations with Annabeth, who I love, she can be a complete moron. Yeah, which is good. I'm glad that she's not always smart just because that's like, oh, well, she's supposed to be smart. It's like in Harry Potter when you have all like the categories of all the houses, like there's not going to always be smart Ravenclaws, there's going to be cowardly uh, Gryffindors, and there's going to be dishonest Hufflepuffs, and there might be some like brave Slytherins because I could give examples but it's like the idea of not everything like fits into like the all the characteristics you can have some of them like then again like if you want to go into Gryffindor mostly you have to ask to be in it because that's a brave thing to do yeah I mean I, I don't exactly know too much about like the lore of how Hogwarts houses work because again like like you mentioned like you can also kind of will yourself to be in other ones but you could be like a dumb Ravenclaw look at Lockhart who was a Ravenclaw and he's super dumb look at Peter Pettigrew he was a Gryffindor but yet he was the most cowardly out of all of them that's true so I guess, I guess there is sort of like a lesson there that it's like you don't always follow your type. Um, we're also talking about Divergent, which I've never actually read, but that's like sort of... Ugh, I hate Divergent. My sister loved Divergent. But yeah, <laughs> it's the idea that it's just like, oh, you take a test and you get ca- like categorized into like these very, like not even sort of um, innately understandable categories. I don't even know what the categories are in Divergent, but it's it's like the same idea of being like, oh, well, you have these very arbitrary qualities and you're going to be this type of person. And then you get to the bottom of the barrel, B. What do you think the bottom of the barrel is for categorization? Oh, I don't know. I mean, like, I keep thinking about, like, real life examples, like people who are like, oh, you're such a Virgo or whatever, or people who yeah, talk about... Yeah, that's the bottom of the barrel, but there's like even more bottom where it's like, I'm a team Jacob, I'm a team Edward. Oh, yeah. Well, because that's also very binary. It's not even multiple. Um, yeah, it's so funny. We just had this conversation and it's, we even mentioned Twilight too, how weird it is that it's like, they don't even have teams, they just have two. <laughs> even if there's like a book that tries to show that those categories don't matter, a lot of times I think in fandom, it tends to like get morphed into this identity thing where it's like oh i very strongly identify as a gryffindor and i am obsessed with it and all i hate all slytherins and it's just like that's not like a real thing that you're talking about that's those people aren't actually slytherins we're not in the wizarding world you can all get along people are more complicated oh man that kind of reminds me i know someone that like is a very big harry potter fan yeah so what happens is they get into those like structures of like, oh, I'm a Hufflepuff. So obviously they speak, oh, that's my Hufflepuff brain going on. And I'm like, um. yeah, you can't like excuse every behavior. <laughs> yeah. Or I even know people who did that with um like the Myers-Briggs personality type thing where it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm just such an INTJ. So that's why I'm like this. Like, OK, you're also just a person and you can act however you want to act. You're not beholden to like this predestined thing. OK, if we're going to talk about like astronomical science and all that stuff, and it's just like, oh, that's my Pisces brain going on. or That's my Gemini showing. And it's like. Well, if you, like, really look at them, they're so generalized characteristics of people that you can easily identify with every single one of them. Like, there's, like, one time where it's just, like, you're brave and you kind of think about, yeah, there was that one time I jumped off that cliff with my friends. Yeah. Oh, I guess I am brave. Yeah. Have you ever seen, um, I I can't say the name of the show on our show, but, um, Penn and Teller's show, BS, um... Yeah. Anyway, they had an episode about uh, horoscopes, and they wrote the same horoscope for everyone, but they gave it to diff- people of different signs, and everyone's like, oh, I really agree with this. Like, this definitely sounds like me. And it was just the same one, because it was such, like, a general characterization of just human <laughs> beings. That's what kind of happens when you have generalization like that. Like, here, we'll we'll go back more into the story and having, like, you have all these attributes of all the characters, same as, like, 
The only one that doesn't quite fit is actually Luke. Like all the stuff that he's supposed to be. Right. He doesn't quite fit that stereotype as as we see here, you know, like people in Hermes cabin have to be like, oh, we're welcoming of new people. We love people. Like we like sending messages and all these things. Whereas Luke's like, I hate everybody. I hate my dad. I hate all these things. And he's the only person that doesn't fit into his like Luke's the only person that doesn't quite fit into like the characteristics of his parent. I mean, I sort of agree with that. I guess the main thing is like Hermes very superficially has to do with being a thief. Like that's one of the characteristics of Hermes is like they're they're kind of like not to be trusted. And that's an aspect of Luke, especially in the first book, because he um he steals he's cunning. the lightning He's like bolts. a silver fox. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Silver you no, know, he's not devil. a silver fox. Not silver fox. That's a completely different thing. <laughs> that's like George Clooney. That's a different... <laughs> Well, I'm thinking Steve Carell now. That's true, yeah. When did that happen? All of a sudden, he's, I don't know, he looks a lot better than he used to. I don't, it's a miracle. Well, because he went from Michael Scott to, like, Michael Scarn. Yeah, he got, he got that, like, just for men kind of grain at the temples look. It's good. Anyway. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? <laughs> We're really off topic. But, I mean, yeah, th- that kind of, that's sort of, like, a part of the lesson of this book in general. Specifically this, The Sea of Monsters is all about not judging a book by its cover. Like, that's, like, a really, like, silly way of phrasing it, I guess. But it's that's kind of the lesson that most people learn. Yeah, and that's kind of, like, the unique thing about Percy Jackson. And as we as we see here, whereas pretty much they get good old Clarice on the airplane, she's flying away, that storyline has been completely wrapped up. She will get to Camp Half-Blood within the allotted time, unless she has, like, a six-hour layaway because of snow. Yeah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine that would be, like, the the plot twist? <laughs> it's just, like, her flight gets delayed. Oh, no, like, she, like, falls asleep and she forgets the Golden Fleece on the airplane. I mean, Florida to New York, like, that's definitely, that could be stopped by snow. I mean, there it's the summer, though, so that wouldn't happen. Maybe a hurricane? Yeah, but remember last year there was, like, weird hurricanes and thunderstorms yeah like, that's true any of that stuff you can throw like logic out the freaking window that yeah also the whole aspect of of zeus just causing like weird random storms because of his temperament well then again there's also the idea of again the golden fleece like turns into like a letterman jacket so like things happen like i like that about this is that once they get off the dock like they're all a bunch of like soaking wet children <laughs> and percy's the only one that's dry Again, it's one of those funny things as to go into the dock and they don't notice the Princess Andromeda and they do all these things. And in the end, they solve their problems. But again, the main threat has to come back in the form of Luke. Yeah. So this is kind of going back to like what I was saying, how I guess that maybe they might run into Chiron, which they don't, which I'm kind of I was kind of surprised by. They might later because they're still in Miami. Um, but they run into Luke. Actually, that's like the surprise um, they get on Miami Beach. So much happens, like just so much gets wrapped up. They hold on. All right, let's let's like really go down the list of things that get <laughs> wrapped up. Okay, so let's see what gets wrapped up in this chapter. Uh, they get the fleece on an airplane heading towards Camp Half Blood. Yeah, Chiron reinstated. Uh, what else? They, oh, they find out that Luke is secretly evil the entire camp. Yeah, well, everyone, I mean, obviously Percy knew that, but yeah, he does the whole, like, like Disney movie thing of secretly recording the evil person doing a monologue. <laughs> like, for me, when it came to that trope, like, I hate it, but I love it at the same time. I was thinking of The Incredibles, where they're having the part, like, you got me monologuing. Yeah, exactly. That's, and I like how he even sort of starts to question why Percy's asking all these things. That he already knows. Well, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it like right now because we'll end up going on a tangent about this. But pretty much what happens is uh, Luke captures Annabeth, Grover, and Percy, and they kind of start like, oh, I'm going to kill you now. Like, we were going to originally keep you alive, but you're a tool. Uh, Cronus can't ha- afford to have you. We we're also going to give you back the Golden Fleece once I was done. What does Luke call him again? He's like something about a weapon, like a a useless weapon or something. Yeah, he's he's Kronos's weapon. Oh, I found it. Yeah, Kronos was right. So th- yeah, this is the the phrase that Luke says after like the most hilarious encounter with the Iris message that um the little bait and switch that that Percy pulls, and then Luke says Kronos was right. Percy, you are an unreliable weapon. You need to be replaced. So that's like a really messed up 
definitely like a very chosen one thing where it's like, oh, you're a weapon, so I can't necessarily destroy you because you have powers that can help us. But now we can't use your powers because you're too much of a goody two shoes. Yeah. And also the idea of like Percy Jackson is a weapon because, again, remember that that huge prophecy about a kid of the big three turning 16, something's going to happen. Yeah, that whole prophecy, which is in the beginning of this book. God, there's a lot to unpack. There is a lot to unpack, but I think the most interesting aspect of it as you, as you go through is kind of like how clever Percy is of like, oh my God, he's crazy. Like this guy is like Charles Manson levels crazy of just if you let him talk, he will say the stupidest things. Just go on and on about his like manifesto, basically. Um, so if I had like the chance to like, talk to like a psychiatrist, like I guarantee you, they would like label good old Luke as like either like a sociopath or at least has extreme narcissism because as you have like the situations of like Percy Jackson like throws the coin in because he's like, oh my God, there's a fountain. We're going to do something with this because we can turn his craziness against him. And because Luke is so caught up in his own ideals, I guess, um, he doesn't even truly realize what's happening, like, even though it's like pretty obvious that he threw the coin into some mist. Well, I mean, it, it gets so obvious because the beginning is even, you tricked us all, I yelled, Luke, even Dionysus at Camp Half-Blood, as like he's summoning the Iris message. Then Percy kind of starts giving him like the runaround questions of like, who poisoned the tree? I did, of course, he snarled. I already told you that. I used the Elder Python Venom straight from the depths of Tartarus. Yeah, like, he didn't have to, like, tell them the manner of death and everything, like... Uh, no, and then it goes, like, funnier. It's like, Chiron had nothing to do with it. Ha, huh, you know he would never do that. The old fool wouldn't have the guts. Yep. And then, of course, it gets even funnier. It's just like, you. so you betrayed your friends and they think they're dummies? Yep. And then afterwards, <laughs> he starts to realize, like, wait a second. Wait, why are you asking me all these questions? Because it gets to the point of where it's like... You fool, we were going to give you the Golden Fleece once we were finished with it. <laughs> Do you know what this reminds me of? Do you know the Bob's Burgers episode where Bob has to go undercover to prove that this guy is selling horse meat? So yes. they keep putting the wire on him, but he has to like phrase things in a way to like get the guy to like incriminate himself. So he's like, so that meat, yeah, it's a, uh, mm, it, is it the same as the one that you gave? Is it, you know, like, meh? Horse meat, like just Wait, isn't sort of. That the one where they they attach a baby monitor because they don't have like the real technical equipment. Yeah, they keep taping different wires to him, and then they they keep failing, or he keeps like accidentally breaking them, um, or like ruffling. Yeah, it's definitely kind of kind of like that, where the way that Percy's phrasing things is to get Luke to not just say, "Oh yeah," just sort of saying aff affirmative to the the theory that. Percy is positing about like, oh, well, this is what your whole evil master plan. He's getting him to like actually recite the entirety of the plan, like verbatim, not even having anything like left up to guesswork. So the way I was thinking about this is pretty much you've kind of come forward in front of a god like Dionysus of Luke's evil plan, including that Kronos is coming back. Something that took Harry Potter five books to do. Yeah. <laughs> that they did it in one chapter. So much happened. And you have like the situation again of it's like, oh, I did all these things. So now everyone realizes that Luke's this evil person and that their plan has been foiled. And also the idea of it's like, wait, why are you asking me these questions? And then he realizes he turns around and that it's the comedic shot of just everyone's just like looking at him. Like no one has said a word. They're just like, what? It can't have blood because they're just witnessing this at the dinner table. So everyone in the camp sees this. Yeah, they're just like all it's sitting. Like, oh my God. It's such like a comedy shot of just like a wide shot of people with like, their mouths open, like trying to eat food and like the, the food's falling off their forks. They're just so stunned with about what they've just heard. Just like picture everyone in Harry Potter in the Great Hall and all of a sudden there's like a PowerPoint presentation of Snape being like, yeah, I killed Dumbledore. <laughs> like that's the hilarity of this scene basically is just him being broadcast to everyone about the betrayal that he's committed against like everybody. Oh no, it's, it would probably be something like if they were to do this in the equivalent of Harry Potter, what would it be? It would be like Harry Potter like pulls the memory out of his brain and projects it on the Great Hall of Dumbledore falling to his death. Spoiler alert, everybody. Snape kills Dumbledore. It's not really a spoiler because people used to put freeway signs up that said it. No, yeah, everybody knows. It's kind of the most well-known spoiler in the world. But 
I just, I found it really hilarious and I, I might have in another context found it to be like too on the nose the way that they, you know, I mean, it happens really fast, but I don't find that silly. I found that, I mean, it is silly, but it's fun still, like the way that it's done. I don't know. Like it, it's so fast. Like literally he reveals the whole thing about Luke in his own words. He just monologues about all the evil stuff that's happening immediately. Dionysus is like, oh, well, I guess you're not needed here because Chiron didn't do the evil thing, which, I mean, everybody said that he didn't. And then Tantalus is like, well, you see, this could be edited and fake. Yeah, only, I guess Iris messages, like, are always true. I don't know well, if that's Well, they have to be. They're live feeds. You can't Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if there's feed. a magic way to, like, concoct an Iris message or something or make someone look like someone else. So when we're, like, looking at this, like, yes, it can be silly, but if you look at the context of the rules of the world, it makes total sense. But what I mean by that, B, is Percy realizes, oh, yeah, Iris messages exist, and we can do this. We can actually, like, put a drachma and make it a plausible thing and still be within the confines of the world and the rule set of this world. So it isn't, like, super cheesy because it's, it's already been established multiple times. All you need is a few like mists and like a little bit of a rainbow and you could pretty much make like an instant message and that's amazing yeah. it's pretty convenient to be fair that there's mist there well percy is the son of poseidon so he can make mist happen anytime he wants but that would have been more conspicuous though i mean he is being pretty conspicuous I, if i were luke i'd be like okay wait what's going on like immediately but the only way that it would make no sense is like percy pulls out a vape and like makes like a vape cloud <laughs> and because it like <laughs> hits the sunlight in a certain way produces like a rainbow and we're not telling percy jackson vapes <laughs> but like you could do stupid stuff like that, but again, they've already established that there's a fountain behind Luke. They have all these things, and in the world, it makes sense. You can't just have, oh, we made an Iris message because of this reason. We have it because Percy Jackson has this ability, and this is how we're going to dupe the audience in a great way. When I think about Iris messages, it's one of those things of like sometimes magical characters don't think outside the box as far as like their own abilities because if they there is the technology to have like like when you said vaping and I know you were joking but there is a technology to have like a mister or something that you could carry with you so you always have a way to send an iris message instead of hoping that you encounter mist in the wild <laughs> Well, yeah, but also it's like the idea of Percy Jackson is nautical boy genius. Well, yeah, so, he like, could do it regardless because he summons water. He could do it like with like yeah. sweat, probably. Give him like he can like MacGyver water. Yeah, but that's like a Percy Jackson exclusive <laughs> technique. But as far as like all the other demigods, they could probably just have like one of those spray bottle, like a Windex bottle full of water, and they just like spray it, and they're like, "I'm gonna do an iris message." Like, B, we're like revolutionizing the demigod world. For all our fellow demigods out in the world, there you go. That's what I'm saying. Like, it just, it seems pretty inconvenient that they always have to wait for a place that can produce mists. And then in this case, it's like such a perfect plot point. Like, oh, he's revealing all of his evil deeds and there's a mist of water right behind him. Like, that's pretty convenient. In the first book, they have a car wash. So that's how they produce the mist. I mean, in the universe, they can't have cell phones because monsters will find them super easily. So you can't just have him calling Dionysus his cell phone, which would make no sense on why Percy Jackson would have this terrible man's <laughs> cell phone number in his phone from 2005. So it would be a flip phone, too, so he wouldn't be able to, like, touch dial or use Siri. His Palm <laughs> Pilot. His Palm Pilot, yeah. I mean, if we look at, like, Batman Returns, like, they do the exact same thing with the Penguin, but they use a CD... Which, for some reason, Batman, like, scratches it, and it makes, like, a record scratch. It makes no sense. Even though that's not how CDs work. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I think that there's, like, myopia going on um, as far as, like, the demigods don't really see past their own abilities. And that's why it's kind of funny how it's like, oh, well, sometimes we encounter a mist, and then you can send a Dyrus message. Like, okay, you're kind of, like, all-powerful beings in a lot of senses, and you wait until you encounter some like 
mist or like a stream or something in order for you to communicate that just seems a little bit ridiculous well no it's anytime they can produce a rainbow so they can like throw it at like a pride flag and all of a sudden you have like an instant <laughs> yeah. message well like an, a genuine rainbow i'm pretty sure so like yeah with like the refraction of light i wonder if that would work with like a crystal now we're like really getting into the nitty-gritty oh, man, of, we're like... gonna go into like dark side of the moon stuff where like you produce like there you go like we're just like coming up with new things every day but kind of like moving on a little bit from this is we could easily talk about Luke's evil plan, but I just want to talk about my favorite scene in this chapter. Like I have several favorite scenes, but my favorite is when it's like, thank you, Tantalus, it's time to leave. And he grabs a cheeseburger and he finally gets it. And then he's like, and he's like, bye. bye. Yeah. And he's just about to put it to his face and it disappears. I actually just want to read that description because it's hilarious. The iris message could be a trick, Tantalus suggested, but his attention was mostly on his cheeseburger, which he was trying to corner with both hands. I fear not, Mr. D said, looking with distaste at Tantalus. It appears I shall have to reinstate Chiron as activities director. I suppose I do miss the old horse's pinochle games. Tantalus grabbed the cheeseburger. It didn't bolt away from him. He lifted it from the plate and stared at it in amazement, as it were as if it were the largest diamond in the world. I got it, he cackled. We are no longer in need of your services, Tantalus, Mr. D announced. Tantalus looked stunned. What? But you may return to the underworld. You are dismissed. No, but no. As he dissolved into mist, his fingers clutched at the cheeseburger, trying to bring it to his mouth. But it was too late. He disappeared, and the cheeseburger fell back onto his plate. The campers exploded into cheering. This also has one of my favorite lines from this chapter, where... It's it's really funny that obviously Tantalus can't get the cheeseburger that he finally grabbed, but I like the aspect of um, how quickly they reinstate Chiron. <laughs> like he's just like, oh well, I guess yeah, we were wrong. So yeah, Chiron is fine. All right, snap my fingers. You're back now. Like I love how quick the turnaround is. Of like, okay, a lot of people weren't really convinced that Chiron was the one who poisoned the tree. That was kind of hearsay. A lot of the reasons why they were blaming him, and then all of a sudden, Mister D the big jerk that he is, all is like, okay, with bringing Chiron back. It just, I don't know. That was a little bit frustrating, but also funny just how quickly the turnaround was on that. Dionysus, um, even though he's just lazy and hates everybody, he still knows what, I guess, what honor is and that had nothing to do with poisoning the tree. So he's going to like, oh, well, he didn't poison the tree, so I have to keep up with like my honor as well as Creon, all he wants to do is help, so I'm gonna. I have to reinstate him because that's the right thing to do, rather than just say, "Yeah, he's he's a big fat liar pants," because that's the the theme of like the old world values of like, "Hey, he never lied, he never did anything. He's been he's been framed, he's been duped." I have to reinstate him because that's the right thing to do as a god. Yeah, it. I just I just feel like weird mixed feelings about Mister D because he seems to be sort of like ambivalent about um. About Chiron, because at first he's like, oh, well, I guess he's banished forever and he might die because of it. Um, anyway, here's our, like, terrible, evil, cannibalistic replacement for him. Like, it just, it seems like he's almost, like, in cahoots with Tantalus in the beginning. And then now he's, like, very quickly like, oh, well, I guess we're bringing back our, like, way better activities director who isn't a previous cannibal and also a terrible person. Um, it just, I don't know. His... His characterization is weird. I have like a mixed opinion about Dionysus, but I've, if you read all the books, I kind of have more of appreciation for him. That's not like a spoiler, but you'll see later on, like he's not, he's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy. Yeah. He's not a, he's a, he's a bad guy, but he's not a capital B, capital G bad guy. Yeah, he's not a bad guy. Yeah. He's he not just, a villain. It's like a guy that works at the DMV and doesn't want to work at the DMV. He wanted to be an astronaut all of his life. And now all he does all day is hand people the driver's license. Yeah, he like lifelessly engages in the bureaucracy of everything. So I guess he just doesn't really have a motivation one way or the other as far as how to behave. But it is pretty frustrating because in the beginning he's like kind of very coldly sends Chiron to death. <laughs> Yeah, and he's also, he doesn't care, because the joke, the running joke throughout Percy Jackson is is that every time he has to address Percy Jackson, he calls him the wrong name, like Peter Johnson. Yeah, he doesn't care. Um, I keep trying to think of, like, his, like, his, like, alignment. Like, would he be, like, true neutral? Like, he just doesn't have any stake in anything, basically. Well, I mean, if we're looking at the alignment of 
Dionysus, I think he'd be like chaotic good almost because he's not a bad person. But then again, like he shows you like horrific things. I don't think he's chaotic good though because I don't think he has strong enough values for him to him he doesn't it's not like he is chaotic in his pursuit of good he's he's not chaotic at all he's he's neutral like he's if anything he's like yeah he's like true neutral well it's also the idea be if he is being forced to live in camp half blood like if he was left to his own devices again we're gonna have to like look at myths that he like he travels around he just wants to be the party god like he gets drunk all the time all he wants to do is have a fun time. He can't drink. He's stuck in pretty much a government job. And he's not having fun. Like, as a god, I'm sure he'd be a much different person. But because he's stuck in this punishment of having to deal with all these crummy kids and doing all these things that he thinks is a terrible job, he hates it. So he doesn't care about anything. He's not going to be helpful. He's never going to be helpful until he becomes a god again after 100 years. Yeah, he's... He just doesn't seem to care about anything, I guess. He just does, like, these perfunctory things. Like, oh, I guess I gotta do this now. Well, I mean, it's easier to have him in that role than having him in Percy Jackson and kind of, like, talking about having a character that's always drunk and having, like, a good time. is Because pretty much Dionysus is the the fun, like, he's the spring breaker, as I call it. <laughs> as, like, he just has throws blow-up parties and, like, this is a safe work podcast. So, like, he he has a lot of children. So that speaks to sort of his life. That's sort of his life. Yeah. Previously. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I just, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of him. I find him very annoying. And he's not just like even like a lovable grump. Like he's actually actively pretty terrible a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. And as the series goes on, maybe we, our opinions might change. Maybe they might not. There's like a lot of things that, that could happen. But in the end... Dionysus does the nice thing of what's like, well, Chiron was right, so we have to reinstate him because that's the right thing to do. I forget the reason why Chiron like had it pinned on him that he was the one who poisoned the tree. Like it was was it all just like hearsay basically? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of process for like abandoning someone from a camp half or like banishing them like is that is there any sort of due process that happens or they're just like well i guess you did it like let's not investigate at all or look into it okay all right there's a reason that's interesting there's a lot more to chiron than meets the eye when it comes to things it's like the best way to put it without spoiling anything is it's kind of like you'll see very quickly like why they picked him out of everyone else but it's a super sneaky thing. Tons happened, and now the best part about this chapter is it ends with all of them dying. Well, almost, yeah, because you think, okay, well, this is all wrapped up, right? Because, like, everyone knows the true the true motivations of Luke. No one's trusting him at Camp Half-Blood. The, Clarice is on her way to Camp Half-Blood with the fleece on a plane, so they don't even have the fleece for them, for Luke to steal, and he's, like, going into, like, weird villain rage of, like, ah, my plan is ruined, whatever. Oh, no, I'm losing all my friends on Facebook now. What did I do? Nice guys finish last. They still need to contend with Luke in the here and now, because now he, like, you know, um, summons a bunch of warriors to kill Percy and his buddies and says, you'll never leave this boat alive is basically how the chapter ends. So even though that a lot gets wrapped up, we still need to deal with the fact that like, even though Luke doesn't have a lot of people on his side right now, he's still alive and there are still people who are willing to help him. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are going to be happening. How are they going to get out of this one? It's not as if they're on a boat surrounded by water or anything. And the guy who's the main character... Has a power of controlling water. <laughs> B, what is the name of the next chapter? Yeah, um, the next chapter is chapter 18, The Party Ponies <laughs> Invade. <laughs> Which, what? B, what is that supposed to mean? I don't know. I don't know what a party pony is. Is What's a party pony? It sounds like something Tyson would say, a party pony. He likes ponies. Is it Rainbow again? No, remember Rainbow... They're, they're gone. They're outie because of all the humans and the pollution. So they're not there. It's not Rainbow and the, and the gang of the hippocampi. Who else has Tyson called Pony? Pony. Oh, wait. I know. I know. It's Chiron. 
That's who. The party ponies are Chiron and his family. Well, that might be a possibility, B. Yeah, I mean, because his, his, his family is like party animals, too. No pun intended. Um, because you heard him in, like, the Iris message. And also, they are conveniently in Miami. Right, which is like a party city. Not, not a party city. Not the store party city. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely the Chiron shows up with his buddies and his, whatever, his, his pony family to attack. His, oh, his party pony posse? Yep. That's pretty great. I can't wait to see that battle. Yeah, I got some good alliteration right there. Woo. Yeah, the part, yeah, it's like, um, what is that like fake book that was on like the reverse dust jacket of the Lemony Snicket? Oh, the pretty pony party. Yeah, the pretty pony party. That's very similar. It's a similar kind of alliteration going. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to the party ponies <laughs> swooping in and helping them or galloping in, whatever. Any other predictions? What do you think is going <laughs> to yeah, happen? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know what else is going to happen. I mean, obviously, I think Chiron's family slash Chiron are going to come in, help them fight Luke and his goons. Um, they're going to escape. They're going to have to figure out a way to get back to Camp Half-Blood. But it's not that pressing, considering that the fleece is already on the way with Clarice. So that's like not really a thing that they have to focus on is like a time limit. But they do need to get back. They can't take a plane. Because of Zeus. I guess they're probably going to take a boat. Because that kind of makes sense because of Percy. Unless they get like some weird other magical transportation. Other, I mean, like that's kind of all that really needs to be wrapped up in this book. Is they need to return to Camp Half-Blood and make sure that the, um, make sure that the tree has been healed. That Talia's tree is back to normal. Yeah, I mean, the only th weird thing that I found for this chapter, B, was there's one line in particular that I think we talked about a little bit, but uh -huh. is that Luke said that he, they were going to use the Golden Fleece and then give it to Percy. Right. To do something with. Don't know what. Or maybe, like, Luke's not a bad guy and he actually wants to save the camp. No, don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Considering he's the one who poisoned Talia's tree to begin with, I don't think so. But, yeah. Hmm. I have no idea, honestly. Um, I don't they're obviously not gonna contend with Luke and Kronos in this book, I don't think. I there's there's too much going on. I think that's like the overarching villain stuff that's happening throughout the rest of the books. I don't it doesn't make sense to me that that would be wrapped up so quickly. But other than that, I don't know. Yeah, I'm actually really excited for next chapter because we're getting down to the nitty gritty of what's going to be happening. Like I think we've kind of reached it's kind of weird when we had, like, the Polyphemus stuff that seemed like the top of, like, the rising action, but now we're, like, heading into, like, little bumps before we reach Return to no Normalcy. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be wrapped up. Like, this whole chapter was just, like, tying up all the loose ends. And, yeah, the Great next chapter me? is chapter 18. You said, how, there's, like, what, 22 chapters? There's 22 like chapters, that? yes. 22 chapters. So we're really, we're getting close. So that's, like, we have, like, a month and a week of episodes before we're done with this book, basically. Yes, and then we get to the next book, and it's going to be super fun. Yeah. And it is like one of those conscious things, B, if it's, we're not even halfway through this book series. We still have about three books left. Right, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that doesn't have to be necessarily wrapped up in this book because it's a series, so I'm... Leaning towards that being the Luke Chrono stuff, if if that does get wrapped up, say, in the next book, then it might, you know, indicate, like, a larger thing at play as far as the gods and all of that. But I, that's, like, my main guess is that it's something bigger than any of, like, the little individual quests that Percy and his friends go on. That is a possibility, and I'm really excited to keep continuing this because it's so much fun to actually sit down and talk about one of my favorite book series. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Just endlessly guessing about what's going to happen next. Well, I mean, that's the great thing about it. And then once we finish these books, we'll just be like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, this makes sense. Oh, wow. Wow. Wait, are you doing a... um? Wow, guys. What's, yeah, yeah. An Owen Wilson impression. Can you do an Owen Wilson wow. impression? Wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't do a lightning McQueen. Or as your people would call it a hoppa. 
Oh, next week, I forgot to tell you guys, we're actually going to have Owen Wilson on. Yep. Mm, that would be weird. Wow, guys. I just really love Percy Jackson. <laughs> wow, I love it. Isn't that right, my he's best a, friend Vince he's Vaughn? He's a boy and also a fish. Good <laughs> child. Wow. <laughs> so then <laughs> Percy like gets in Lightning McQueen and they like, go real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you, what character would you cast um, Owen Wilson as? <laughs> Owen Wilson, he'd have to be like, I feel like if you're going to cast Would he be him, a party pony? Yeah, he'd be a party pony. Like, he'd be like, a, be good. like a blonde horse. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I have like little horse legs. Wow. This is my cousin, <laughs> Chiron. Wow. <laughs> and then you'd have to have, oh no, because then all the party ponies would have to be like Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn. Oh, no. This is, like, the worst adaptation ever. <laughs> uh, one one of these days, we should, like, do a fan cast, even though oh, I don't God, like fan Oh, God, like, cast, the worst fan cast worst. we could possibly muster. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how could we ruin, like, a movie worse? Yeah. With, <laughs> I'm trying to think of someone terrible. <laughs> like, um, with Polly Shore as Percy. <laughs> like, something terrible like that. <laughs> no, I'd want, like, Tina Fey. Tina Fey as Percy. That wouldn't even that would be like not even as bad as Polly Shore as Percy. Um Who would we get? Like I feel like if you're gonna get someone for like Chiron, it has to be someone like With Will Ferrell as Rainbow. <laughs> no, Will Ferrell would be Chiron. He already has like the No, Will Ferrell would be Grover. Oh no! There's my fan cast. I'd wanna have Dionysus as John C. Riley. I think that's too perfect. Hey guys! Wow. Actually, that works pretty well. That's actually genuinely good casting. I also just pi- picture um, uh, Danny DeVito because that's just how I conceptualize of Chiron, or not of Chiron, of uh, Mr. D. Oh no, I would love Chiron to be Danny DeVito. Yeah, I could see that too. Well, it would just basically be his character in Hercules. Anyway, we could like talk about this all day long and how much of a powerhouse Danny DeVito is. <laughs> Just a real powerhouse. Did we get any mail this week? Unfortunately, we didn't get any Iris messages this week. I think maybe because no one could find uh, some mist and some rainbows. Yeah, they couldn't find a mist <laughs> to message us. But uh, that's okay. Maybe because we recorded this episode like back to back pretty much. So yeah, that's a big shock. Uh, we did get an iTunes review. Do you want to read it, B? Uh, yeah, we got a an iTunes review from Lyle Boy O Two, who says, "I love this podcast. I haven't read these books in a while, so it's nice to get a refresher on the series. It makes me want to go back and read all the Riordan." Um, yeah, that's just a nice little concise message. Thank you so much. For me, like when it comes to like listening to podcasts about specific books, like I've been recently re-listening to the Duke and Duchess podcast, which I just want to give out a big shout out. They read. It's like this couple that does a podcast. They read a bunch of high fantasy, such as the King Killer Chronicles and the Stormlight Archive. And every time I like listen to it, I'm just like, man, I really want to like reread these books again. But like each one is like a tome, so it, it spends so much time rereading it when I could read other books. And that's the cool thing about like listening to podcasts is you get super pumped up. Same as how like when you listen to like Harry Potter podcasts, I'm just like, ah, oh, man, I gotta like read Harry Potter again. I just reread it, but I'll reread it again. That's okay. I, I definitely, I listen to, if we're promoing our favorite book podcast, I listen to the SSR podcast, um, which is just like a great sort of like retrospective um, podcast on all like different like YA and books that people read growing up. But it also actually this week they're doing new reads November, so it's actually new YA. But um, yeah, every time I listen to an episode of that, I'm like, oh, I guess I should reread The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe again and see how that stands up to my critique yeah that's like the interesting thing about like you love all these beloved books and then you reread them again as adult and you're just like what did i read as a kid why did i read this what yeah (laughs) yeah you miss out on a lot for sure like definitely a lot of the allegorical stuff in some of the more like weirdly complicated books anywho i think that's everything that we got this week we're at a 105 itunes reviews which is really awesome. Holy guacamole. That's a lot of cheese. And we're now in the top 200 podcasts for literature. Oh my God. Yeah, you told me that. That's really exciting. Um, 
Yeah, definitely. Um, when are we going to do that giveaway? Should I mention it at all? Yes, we're going to start doing a giveaway soon. We actually got a lot of amazing, like what I mean by amazing, I mean we just have stacks and stacks and stacks of the Lightning Thief musical CDs, and we can now give them away. Thanks to our, our good friend, Joe Trace. Yeah, we have a bunch of Lightning Thief CDs. There may, in fact, be one sitting in my uh, kitchen waiting for me to listen to it. Um, the only CD player I own is in my car. It seems almost weird as if like we're going to like listen to it or something. Yeah, there might be an episode about that. Thanks to his generosity and also his abundance of CDs, we have like several um, Lightning Thief CDs to give away. So how the giveaway is going to work is all you have to do is send us an Iris message. Uh, throughout the week and we'll pick one of the people at random unfortunately for right now it's going to be us only if you want to pay for the shipping for for international which a cd i don't i don't know how much it's going to cost it's just the reason why we're doing that right now is cost yeah yeah i don't exactly know um us and i think canada is actually pretty affordable too so like us and canada is pretty reasonable but as far as like overseas and stuff like that, there's like customs and all sorts of like it, it just wouldn't be worth it. And we don't know what the condition would be like once you get it. But that's something we're going to give away some CDs. We're going to really have a fun time doing that. I think that kind of like wraps up our our show a little bit. Where can they find you, B? You can find me on Twitter at B. Kelly Gorman. And you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com. And if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. And if you want to follow our show on Twitter, you can follow us at Halfblood underscore radio. And if you want to send us an Iris message and be eligible for a Percy Jackson, the Lightning Thief musical CD, you can email us at radiocamphalfblood at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Patreon at Patreon slash radiocamphalfblood. We also have t-shirts on T Public, so just type in Radio Camp Half-Blood and they should pop up. Other than that, I think that's pretty much it. Every time you see us in the wind and listen to us, it's going to be super mysterious. <laughs> yep, just find a rainbow and send us an iris message. I'm Zach. I'm B. And keep staying mortal. Bye. Bye, guys.